Woo! Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And it is, oh my God, dude, seriously, it's such a treat to be here today. We have with us Tom Cronin. Tom, how are you? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> I love the excitement. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so for those tuning into Tom for the first time, which may be unbelievable, um, he's a leading meditation master and he's passionate about reducing stress and chaos in people's lives. And he's here to help people find peace and calm. A big thing that I love him for is the Stillness Project, which is basically here to inspire people to meditate daily. Tom, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along. <laughs> <laughs> so tuning in, like there's, um, there's so much to talk to, but the key thing that I really love about um, some of the talks that, you know, like I've been exposed to of yours is this whole conversation around, how do you articulate it? The user dependent universe or the observer dependent universe? Observer dependent, yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what, what that means. Well, you know, what, what is reality? Um, is really so subjective Mm. to each individual experiencer. You know, uh, I'm sitting in this room in a back sunroom of an Airbnb. Now, if I wasn't here and I wasn't experiencing this room, then what's the experience of this room? Um, And, you know, if there's a lizard in this room, then that's experience of this room is very different to my puppet dog, which is in the room next door, was in this room. And, uh, and, you know, it depends what state of mind I'm in, what state uh, of experience the lizard's having, you know, which could be complete fight flight. You know, it's, it's so relative subjective and yeah. subjective. I love that because I, one of my observer. Yeah. One of my early meditations that I crafted for myself when I was on this journey was the, the couch or the meditation cushion I would sit on, I would try and take on that inanimate object and just sort of see what the space would be like without my perceptions, my stories, my thoughts, my framework, my emotion, my energy in the space and just go, what does my living room feel like when I'm not home, you know, and I'm just the couch, but yeah, yeah. please continue. Beautiful. Yeah. It's so powerful to do that. And what, what I like to do with my students is to work on this process of it. The analogy I use is Velcro. And what we're going to do is we're going to Velcro apart the egoic, identity which is a narcissistic formed uh state of a mind that seems to be you and then there's presence itself Mm. or consciousness itself and so in each moment there's just consciousness or presence or awareness that is here and then there's also depending on how engaged involved uh, or developed it is, is the egoic identity that's in this experience as well. Mm. So you can have, for instance, uh, you know, you be in a situation where someone might be throwing some cursing words at you. Now the ego is going to get entangled in that scenario Mm -hmm. and it's going to be identified by that experience because the ego is consistently identified by the world around it. Mm-hmm. Someone says something really good about the ego, the ego feels really good about itself. Yep. Someone says really terrible about the ego, the ego feels really bad about itself. The ego is so ridiculously confused <laughs> and no idea who it is and it's easily influenced by the world around it. But yep. presence itself is completely unmoved mm. and it's just simply watchfulness. Complete, unjudged, unbiased, complete, uninfluenced watchfulness of this experience and that's the higher self or... Um, pure consciousness itself, which mm. just observes. And it just observes with equanimity and with bliss and with unconditional love. And we are actually both of those things. We are the egoic identity, unless you're completely in that state where there's a complete dissolving of the ego, which is a very, very rare state. And I'm not sure if any, I, I actually thought Eckhart Tolle had arrived at that point mm. when I was referencing this state to some people and some Zen masters. And they said, oh, no, Eckhart's got lots of ego, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, for me, I definitely know, you know, when my ego is getting engaged and involved in the scenario, there's a charge, yeah, you know. There's totally. An emotion. And emotionally, a yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that defines the, the reality of the egoic's presence in that situation. 
Yeah, I find that really interesting. And uh, yeah, like I spent the first six months of this year getting trained up by Eckhart Tolle School of Awakening. And it was a, a really fascinating um, journey to go on in terms of, yeah, the conversation that he had was both on presence and purpose, which for me was mm-hmm. a really fascinating space to walk into because being a meditator for eight years, it was all about presence, presence, presence. He wrote The Power of Now. But then he was like, yeah, but people need a purpose. And it's like, oh, there's also space for what's coming next then, you know, it's like beyond just the present. And I realized the conversation around the present is so pertinent because coffee anxiety (laughs) and just like the whole conversation has been around what's next so deeply that, you know, it's like healing that is all about being in the present at the moment, but there is, you know, this whole, yeah, the just space to have a conversation around what's next is a, is a really interesting one that I've, I've been walking into through this, through this year. But, um, you, you mentioned consciousness, you know, so the idea that you delineated the two between like consciousness and ego, um, does the ego have a presence and the consciousness has a presence of its own as well? Or are they like, how does presence inform those two um, kind of nebulous you know, concepts? Ego, ego doesn't have presence, no. Um, e- ego is thinking, feeling body. Right. Um, presence doesn't have thinking, feeling body. So it's like the divine. Think of presence as the divine. Yep. So the divine doesn't have thinking, feeling body. The divine expresses through forms. Uh-huh. Um, and coming back to purpose, the interesting thing is purpose is a human construct. Mm. Um, but what we do have is the universe seeking expression through forms mm. um, because the universe uh, was formlessness but then manifested form mm. to express and experience itself. Mm other than pure presence or pure divine or pure God, we can use in a multitude of different words to experience something that's formlessness, unboundedness, yep. um, timelessness, but w- w- let's just stick with divine now. Mm-hmm. Um, so the divine expresses itself through form. Mm. And that's where we, as humans, put this construct called purpose, mm. which is really... You know, I, I've just had a four-week tour of traveling around the U.S. doing speaking gigs for the, yeah. the release of our film, and I decided that after that, and I'd pre-booked this weekend or, or four days away yeah. once I got back to just sit and be. And mm-hmm. I've got my family here, and we're in a very small country town on the very uh, beautiful bay, which is very quiet. And there's a lot of just being and just sitting. You know, I spent yesterday on the deserted beach down in the national park. You know, a long period of time just being, but it's interesting. Um, in the state of just being what bubbles up as you become more and more in a stillness is this inclination or compulsion for more of that pure consciousness, more of that uh, presence to want to express itself. Mm. As I become the conduit, it's like, okay, time for action. (laughs) And it's not like a hungering, aching. If I don't do this, I'm going to feel a huge sense of lack. It's like, how do I express yep. being through me and action? Yeah, it's and that's where we get. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that's where purpose manifests itself. Mm. Yeah, I love the way you've articulated through that. Action. I love the way you've articulated that and that expression. So, what you've highlighted there is something that you know sits really present for me, which is the the, the fact that curiosity is like so fundamental to the to the fabric of everything. You know, the fact that. Um, yeah, like we are the universe experiencing itself, like we are consciousness bent in, in a way, looking in on itself and just that curiosity. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm mass- like massively attracted to your work when you, when you speak so deeply of observation because that place of observation then affords us the ability to be curious of oneself, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, this, it's the, the nature of the universe to, to be everything and know everything at all times but to be able to forget that as well (laughs) (laughs) and be curious about trying to find and remember that. (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's a fascinating game that we play (laughs) in the, in the the rediscovering of what we already are. Enlightenment isn't something we find. Enlightenment is the rediscovering of what we already innately already are. 
love that. So tell me a little bit more. Let's let's like uh, go back into like how is how does your story inform like you know your journey through all of this? Because obviously we're having a really incredible conversation here. You travel all the way around the world delivering retreats, seminars, talks, and making mindfulness everybody's business, which I absolutely adore you for. Um, yeah. And so in that space, um, but it wasn't always the case, right? Like you had a had a past with what was going on in there and what brought you to meditation yeah i was a broker in finance doing swaps and bonds on international global markets um massive trading room floor 150 guys yelling and screaming and trading you know <laughs> 5 10 20 50 100 million dollar tickets at a time of, of swaps and bonds for the investment banks they were basically looking to do these transactions through a central hub a number of different central hubs ours being one of the um, world's largest money brokers and so it was fast it was furious it was is this like the pits that you see in the movies and everybody's yelling and it's raucous it's like a monkey pit with like yeah, yeah is this kind of yeah <laughs> it, it was very similar i mean it was more like if anyone's seen wolf of wall street it would, yeah that exactly was a that. very close example of what a- it <laughs> yeah very very yeah. close a lot of crazy stuff was going down back then in the late 80s, early 90s. Okay, so and, somewhat you know, the antithesis of Zen, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> complete antithesis. It was the absolute other end of the spectrum. And this is the fascinating thing, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, you get pulled into the story and the glamour and the charm and the excitement and your whole nervous system's getting completely overwhelmed and stimulated by that. Um, and so that was the nature of the job and the lifestyle for quite some time. And, you know, not only was it the industry in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, a lot of partying, you know, there was all pretty much unchecked, you know, way of, um, of doing your job uh, before HR came along and regulations and all sorts of things and committees. And so it was pretty much like a, you know, wild west Mm. of finance markets and not only that but the the whole rave culture just opened up in australia and i got really swept along by that as well i Mm. love this idea of these huge massive warehouse parties which was a whole new phenomenon you know it went out of the sort of clubs in the sort of 70s and 80s and all of a sudden these big massive warehouses in you know big industrial estates would just put on these you know thousand two thousand five thousand people parties of Mm. You know, starting at 11 o'clock at night and going through till 7, 8 in the morning and then going to recovery parties. So this was this incredible excitement for me to experience and explore that, you know, ecstasy, MDMA, this sense of unity and harmony and love and connectivity with everyone in this room for hours was mm. like a utopian paradigm. I just couldn't believe that I'd walked into this area. Yeah. And, of course, anything like the way I was working, the way I was living, the weekends, that level of overwhelm of the nervous system has to show up some level Mm. of symptom. And so I started getting some extreme symptoms, which is really the way I look at symptoms is a red light on the dashboard that's letting you know that you've got a problem and you need to stop and have a look at what's causing that red light to come on. So that's what a symptom is to me. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'd ignored those red lights and try to put a little black tape over the top of them so that they wouldn't keep appearing. But, of course... Until you actually address the cause You're of classic that. Aussie, <laughs> no I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just push them through, right? <laughs> yeah. So those symptoms continue to exacerbate, and I was getting anxiety and insomnia and these extreme panic attacks, which I didn't mm. really know anything about. But uh, over time, those symptoms exacerbated. It became a really deep, dark depression, mm. uh, really extreme panic attacks. A crippling, crippling waves of, of panic would come through at certain times to the point where eventually uh, in 1996 it it culminated in a full-blown, I guess it it was diagnosed as a nervous breakdown. And, uh, you know, I put on pharmaceuticals, sent to psych clinics, uh, seeing psychiatrists, put on a bit of suicide watch, and things were pretty... um, Grim. Very grim, very dark, very... A deep sense of hopelessness, self-loathing at who I'd become. Mm. And uh, it was at that point where I developed agoraphobia. So that's the inability to leave the house. You're sitting at home and you're literally just, yeah, you're bedridden and just watching a lot of TV. Mm. And it was at that time that I was watching uh, some documentaries and one was about his property developer, Bruno Grollo, big Melbourne property developer. And a tiny slither of that story was that he used meditation, a particular style called transcendental meditation. 
and he was sitting in a chair wearing a suit meditating and it was like this light went on you know it's something that I'd never been exposed to meditation was nothing in my world at all you know I was a broker on a trading room floor and lived on a farm you know uh, prior to that so I'd never come across meditation but that was like this sort of epiphany and this light bulb moment that inspired me to start exploring meditation that was the, the start of my journey into that amazing amazing and then so when you got introduced to this idea this philosophy that perhaps meditation could help um where did you go yeah you know back then as uh, for any of the younger people that are listening uh, there's no google no ipads yeah no exactly this so is why, this is why i do? ask yeah. are you like uh, are you off in like tibet now or to bob uh, like, yeah what happened? Nah, you know it's you, you, you know this thing you go back in time you think wow this is how we used to do things i picked up the yellow pages well, the what? No, speak. sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Those are, no, it's a big book that had yellow pages in it. And, you know, I, I, I actually still remember to this day, this was nearly 25 years ago, I still remember yep. to this day, picking up the yellow pages, opening up on the coffee table mm. and looking up M for meditation and mm. scrolling down. And I remember scrolling down, looking up the different meditations and I started ringing them all up and I started to, to go to different centres and looking into what, these different types of meditation were. But interestingly, and I still remember this today, was that um, you could pay extra money to highlight your, your business. Ads. Yeah, totally. Uh, and, and transcendental meditation was in red. Mm. Everything else was in black. And there was this idea, because, you know, I, I was really into MDMA and ecstasy. And when I heard this word transcendental, there was something about that that this because transcendental means or to transcend means to go somewhere to mm. go beyond and that's what I was always seeking with MDMA was to well, go MDMA beyond. is countercultured with that trance music which is transcendental trance of course yeah. yeah trance that's exactly it you know you think about that trance and transcendental it's like mm. wow there's these these parallels there and mm. um, interestingly when I started to so I, I look, went into an intro talk of transcendental meditation and everything that the the teacher was saying was like just hitting these points time and time again through that one hour talk it was like yeah. oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness things like you know the guy was first and foremost he was a neuroscientist and a doctor he um you know he uh had all these scientific studies and there was all these reports and talked about outcome oriented fulfillment versus internal fulfillment talked about biochemistry of oxytocin and serotonin and I knew through MDMA that what MDMA was doing was triggering huge amounts of serotonin and oxytocin in my body. But when mm -hmm. I saw these reports and realized that meditation could do the same thing, but without this huge, I was like, and so when I learned very quickly, I realized this parallel to what mm. I was seeking in the raves and the drugs and the drinking and the partying and the money and the women and everything was actually what I was looking through for in my spiritual exploration and mm. it, and what I what I started to find through meditation and that was a phenomenal shift for me that it didn't have to come from all of those other things it was something outside that yeah. yeah it was something that meditation was helping me find within myself yeah I think that's a that's a really poignant point that you know like we we often seek for these things externally and there's so many ways we can manufacture these stories un, un, unconsciously you know in terms of what we're actually seeking for but there is that innate as you mentioned before that innate consciousness that is looking to experience itself in a in a certain way so I've got a I've got a, a, a question which I'm, I'm probably going to butcher the articulation of it if you come along with me um the consciousness of okay so you've gone through this journey and you found yourself now meditating and realizing that actually the journey somehow through where you've been has landed you here um and now you found this amazing tool and this ability to connect with yourself like connect to the experiences that you were seeking through meditation through going inwards through yourself um is there a dialogue around how much of the past was necessary to land you where you did? In every case for every person. Mm. In yeah. every case for every person. Every, every experience is, I wouldn't say manufactured, every experience is an opportunity um, to guide us to what we're actually here for. Mm which is to remember, to rediscover, to find. I mean, we, in our early embryonic development as a human being, um, think that we're here to have children make money and pay off our uni fees and pay off our mortgage and 
um, you know, in, in the film's way, uh, one of the characters through stories um, in the film, you know, she got to the pinnacle of the finance industry mm. and realized that she was earning money to spend money. And she's like, is this it? Is this the yep. human evolution? Is this what we're here for? And that's when she started to explore the inward direction of attention. And I think that it sounds, and it's going to be hard for people to probably hear it, but uh, our experiences in life are all in some way, shape or form opportunities for us to, to find that inner mm. state, that inner being in Sanskrit it's called Turiya, the fourth state, the state of silence and stillness within Mm. Yeah, I, I resonate with you quite deeply because one of the most controversial things that I seem to be qu- quoting myself on is that stress is actually your ally. Um, it's actually calling you into alignment, um, you know, because it's it's like that red light on the dashboard, you know, it's letting you know that something's wrong. It's just building that relationship with understanding it rather than putting black tape over it. Um, one of the most fascinating things that... Um, I learned from, from yourself um, through <laughs> watching your videos was um, actually that yeah, I heard you say that actually, you know, the, these dark challenges that you've had in the past going into these, these places, you've actively tried to like in the process of like writing the, the books that you've written, like going into writing books and understanding some of the energy from the past better. You've tried to meditate and then connect to the energy in the past and you actually found that you actually couldn't go there which was like a, like a shift in consciousness because you've actually gone through like, uh, like a, not just like a state change, but like physically a stage change almost. Would you describe it that way or am I, uh, yeah, can you articulate? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, we, uh, there's other terms that are used for this called tone scale, which is our, our vibrationary state. Sure. And that what's that called? Sorry. Tone scale. I think Scientology uses that. It's, it's a, it's sure. a way of measuring someone's emotional status. Mm. Um, and you know, you can, you can look at the, the frequency of emotions or hurts, H E R T Z. Um, and we've got these scales from anger and shame and guilt and rage, you know, as they move up the scales, I think like, you know, guilt and, and hatred are down at around 50 hertz. If you move up the scales to sort of like um, love's around 528, uh, then you've got some ah, joy. They oscillate ecstasy. higher and faster. Yeah, that's right. And so, um, you know, as we sort of continue our own evolution, become more and more of the bliss state, the joy state, the love state, then it, it's actually harder to go back into those lower vibrationary states. The gap is just too big. And that's what I found, you know, in writing the books and things like that. But that said, that doesn't mean I don't have times when I'm not struggling. You know, there's definitely still challenges. There's definitely still struggles. There's definitely still, you know, um, some difficult times that, you know, I go through. So um, I just think it's important we preface that. But um, definitely there's there's a shift that happens through sustained long-term practices. Mm. where you kind of continually establish new status quos, new um, states that you fluctuate within those states relatively, but to get back to where you were is very, very, uh, not that you'd want to, but very, very difficult to try and recalibrate, re-experience that when I was trying to capture that essence in the book. Mm. So, Tom, pardon me for being so chop suey around the episode. It's just rarely do I get to have such a deep conversation with someone that, like, I resonate so deeply with, and it's a real blessing to have you here. So, one of the questions I get a lot is, you know, in that, like, you you mentioned the sustained ability, like, once you sustain the ability of, like, uh, sustained practice and the ability that comes on the backside of that. um, One of the challenges that I interface with a lot is people say, yeah, but they don't, I liken it to compound interest almost, you know, it's like, you, you know, you like a, a P a day, a P a day, a P a day, eventually like, you know, the interest on it is huge. Um, and that's where I really like in meditation too, because you can't like, almost, you can't see it like, you know, like every day working on it. How do you then like some people have some real challenges making it through the, the motivation piece because they're not inspired necessarily to, to navigate through that process. Do you have bits and pieces that can help people that are in that stage where they really want to try meditation, but they, they find it hard to see the reward from it and they can't really plug into it. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, it, and it's understandable. So, you know, the, the rewards from meditating are very subtle mm. and very long-term and we're very deeply conditioned even more and more so as the world speeds up to wanting and being able to experience very instantaneous gratification. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing even my longer term meditator students complaining of them dropping off their meditation practices, mm-hmm. finding their meditation practices slipping and falling into all the other ways that we find immense levels of pleasure. And if you think about ultimately everything that motivates every single person on the planet in every single action, mm-hmm. regardless of who they are and what they're doing, whether it's crack cocaine in a ghetto in LA or whether it's meditating as a monk in Tibet or scrubbing a bathroom floor in Kenya or, you know, doing a grocery shopping in Ohio, you know, everything that every single person is doing right now on the planet is in some shape or form in quest to be fulfilled. And we clean our bathroom floor because we feel better when our floor's clean. We feel better when we go to the grocery store, do the grocery shopping in Saturday morning traffic because we feel better when we've got food in the pantry. We go to the tin cannery and put, bottles on bottle tops for a job because we get feel better when our mortgage is paid. And so this is the motivating action, uh, motivating incentive behind every action. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, is our action giving us what we're seeking? Is it giving us fulfillment? Is it, is it giving us the ultimate destination what we're actually trying to find and that's Mm. to be deeply fulfilled and you know there's a gallup poll that came out recently that served uh surveyed 155,000 people in 140 countries Mm. the proof we're actually getting more uh, sadder getting we're getting sadder angrier and more anxious than we ever have been before and yet we're more wealthy collectively on the planet than we ever have been before and so there's a distinct separation between what we're seeking and what we're getting, mm. uh, we're seeking fulfillment. What we're getting are lots of things, um, and we're not getting the fulfillment. And so, what meditation allows us to do is to find the sustained, long-term experience of fulfillment. But it's it's subtle; it's not instantaneous. And we just have to a have faith. I think for me, reading books from ancient sages and saints um, and reading information and reading contemporary books by meditators um, gave me a deep sense of faith that these experiences were possible. Mm. And it was in my sights to continually move in that direction, to experience what I knew was possible, what had been written and talked about for thousands of years. So I had a deep sense of faith that this incredible experience of enlightenment or in the process of getting enlightened was available to me. And so I had a strong sense of faith and an incredible quest to get there um, to the point where that might have even become detrimental to me because, of course, that, that quest to get there is actually sometimes the impediment to actually being there, what you already are. Oh, <laughs> that's so <laughs> profound. We can talk about that a little bit more later. But um, I think firstly have faith that this incredible levels of, of bliss and quiet and peace is within us all and within our reach. Mm. Um, and your testament to that, I'm, you know, some testament to that, you know, going from a badass, you know, drug taking broker to finding a lot of that a lot of the time doesn't mean that I'm certainly not perfect, but certainly get these incredible long windows of having that experience. Um, but secondly, just do an audit of what you're doing on a daily basis. And then ask yourself, as you look at all of your actions and, you know, what I did was I came up with this 72, 20 method. Mm. which is looking at my day and realizing that because I was trying to work out how I'm going to fit my meditations in. And I'm like, man, I'm so busy. I'm a busy broker and I'm <laughs> developing yeah. houses and, and, and how am I going to do this? So I realized that my day had 24 hours in it and each hour had three blocks of 20, which is 72 20 minute pieces of pie. Mm. And I realized that I was allocating, if I did a big pie chart with 72 pieces in, I was allocating 72 pieces of pie to getting fulfilled yet i was miserable i was depressed i was suicidal i was anxious Mm. so i had to do something different with my 72 pieces of pie and i didn't want to change my job because i couldn't afford to Mm. (laughs) i had mortgages till my you know uh, up to my eyeballs and um and there was a few things i couldn't change so they were a given and they stayed in the pie chart but there was a lot of other variables that i could move around Mm-hmm. and I could replace. And so one of the things that I did was I simply took out two pieces of pie, and maybe that was from drinking or doing drugs or clubbing or whatever, and then I added two pieces of pie in, which were meditating for 20 minutes, morning and evening. Mm. And that alone was such a significant shift, and I just recommend to everyone and anyone listening, 
just do your own research. You know, I have faith and, yeah, it sounds really good that this thing's there and there must be something in it for 5,000 years people have been doing it. There's got to be a reason for it. It's been around for a while. But just generations upon generations upon generations of misled people. <laughs> Surely not. It's still the test of time, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, but secondly, do your own research. Just see what life's like when you meditate twice a day, and give it a give it a month. Just give it a month, and just see. Every student of mine says, "My God, life is like so much better when I meditate twice a day." Um, and yeah, it's just a no brainer that when you do the research, you'll get your own experience, and let your own experience do the talking. Mm, yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really helpful. Um, one of the one of the only real like hacks that I happen to install is like I often ask people when they start to sit down like how long can you meditate for how long can you sit still for and I'll be like ten minutes I'm like cool meditate for five no like, no I can yeah. sit for ten and it's like no nah, sit for five <laughs> because yeah. like now you got no excuses you know what I mean like you, yeah. you said ten so sit for five <laughs> and it's just like and then let that build a practice and then let the practice build on top of that and it seems to. Yeah. Seems to seems to work well. There's a question again. I'm trying to articulate something that is a bit nebulous, but so through the art of meditation now, like, and you know, I'm just speaking to my own practice, like my own practice, and where it's kind of taken me, and then obviously reflecting on, you know, you've been on this path a lot longer than I have. Um, there comes this point where your life begins to shift, right? It's not just you're con- like you're engaged in a practice, and it's almost like too obvious to state, but it, the conversation I feel like needs to be had. Like you, you're kind of engaged in a practice to help you from your current life situation, right? But then your entire life tends to shift. So, such as yourself, myself included, traveling the world now, facilitating like the conversation around presence and being still and embracing silence and just the power of meditation, connecting to your breath. That now has become like the life and then it becomes your lifestyle as well um there's this really interesting dynamic uh i guess from the space of observation you start observing things that don't serve you is that kind of the is what is what going on or can you tell us more about that i think it works on so many levels and it's such a great topic um i think firstly there's a synchronization that happens Mm. uh on vibrationary levels so for instance, if we're going back to those Hertz scales, the, yep. the vibrationary scales, um, if your vibration starts to shift from fear, anger, rage, guilt, shame, all that sort of stuff, very low frequencies, mm. and through meditation you're clearing out all these low energies and you're moving your energy up into sort of more lovingness, more calmness, more joyfulness, totally different frequency scale, mm. then you're going to naturally start to want to align your actions to something of similar vibration. Mm. So, you know, um, going to a death metal concert at three in the morning in a basement um, when you're in a frequency of 528 hertz or higher, there's a complete misalignment. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to enjoy it, but there's there's possibly going to be a a misalignment, whereas waking up for a sunrise and doing a yoga session is going to be like an alignment. And so, you know, having uh, healthy food, healthy drinks, healthy lifestyle, there's just a synchronized sort of alignment there between the way you feel and the actions and the people and the places that you want to experience as a, as a vibrationary being. Um, and so you tend to find that your interests and your choices start to change. Um, and so... It's, you know, it's just a, a slight example, you know, when I was a broker, we had these personal trainers on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now, there was a, a couple of guys that I used to work with and one was like badass. He would just be, he would come in at like eight o'clock in the morning after having no sleep and on a massive bender and it's not a judgment because I used to do the same, but he'd come in with two meat pies and two cans of Coke for breakfast, right? I kid you not, right? He'd walk in, broken <laughs> farting, no sleep, completely still wasted, two meat pies, two cans of Coke, that was his breakfast. Yeah. Then they started to provide us with these personal trainers. Now, the same guy after a personal training session will come in with a salad, mm. right? And that's because he's feeling better and what he wants to put into his body, he wants to have some more of synchronized yeah, when he feels match. crap. Yeah, 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 more match. I think that happens generally in our life. You know, it's, it's, it changes the way we live, the people we want to live with, the people, the places we want to work. All that starts to change as our inner state changes. Um, so there's definitely that that's playing out. 
there's this other shift that seems to happen I've been noticing with people. It was definitely the case with me, definitely the case with you and a lot of my students is, you know, there's a sequence which is seeker, finder, sharer. Seeker, and finder, it, sharer. Yep. So generally we're seeking, you know, we start off in the dark room. The first thing you do when you walk into a dark room is you climb around looking for the light and you're looking, looking, where's the light, where's the light? And eventually after seeking for a while, um, you find the light switch or you find light. And so mm. you've got, for instance, you, it was meditation. Other people might be plant-based medicines or whatever. Mm. Um, but you find some way of making your life lighter and more um, illuminated mm. and less dark. And then the next stage in the sequence is once you find that, it's like, oh, my goodness, like other people might want this as well. And then you want to, you just have this incredible overarching compulsion to want to share what you found mm. um, to the point where, you know, for me, I was one of those annoying people that just had to tell everyone at every dinner party, every work function, every conference, like that people must have been so bored of me. But until I learned how to structure that and deliver that to people that had some level of inquiry, but that's the process I tend to find happens as well because they find a sharer. There's just a little bit of a pain body in that reflection. <laughs> that you're reflecting back to me. I've been that guy where it's like yeah. when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> it's like early days, it was like, oh, your toe hurts. Have you tried meditating on <laughs> It's like, shut up, Everett. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so um, I think there's um, – there's uh, the conversation that you were just sharing was really poignant. It was the first time I actually kind of mentally could see that the shift within us is actually has the potential to create the ripple effect across the planet. Like I've kind of understood that for a long while that, you know, inspired evolution is all an inside job and I'm just here to like evolve and do the best that I can and trusting that that then spreads to where it needs to. But the way you described it in terms of like it being a frequency and then, you know, you make different choices based on that. Like then I'm doing more of the salad thing, but then obviously I'm voting with my dollars more on those salad things. And that kind of creates a ripple effect. That was the most uh, visually I've ever seen that inside my system. So thank you so much for sharing that. That really, really poignant. Um, the, the conversation you were having about, you know, the difference between uh, like having that faith of like getting there, but then potentially that being a distraction and a bypass of just being there already and the dichotomy between the two. Can you articulate a little bit around that for us? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a real conundrum that we can face as seekers mm. because the idea of seeking is that there's this idea that there's something we don't have that we need to mm. find. Yeah. Yeah. In actual fact, we are already it. So it's actually not so much that we need to seek and find. We actually, at some point, need to let go of the seeker. Mm. Because if there's a seeker, that means that we're, we're not it. And we're it, unwhole. We, yeah, we're unwhole. And the divine's not seeking. Mm. The divine's not looking to be somewhere. The divine's not looking to get something. And we are the divine. It's omnipresent. Mm. And so that's the separation that starts to create... Uh, uh, I, I guess a, a barrier to our experience of being what we already are, which is presence. Mm. And it's, it's, I liken it to this analogy of a cast on the leg. Okay. So being a seeker and looking for a practice, just using a practice is when the leg is broken, we need to stabilize the leg. Now the, the cast plays such an integral role for that legs healing. And the cast isn't actually healing the leg. The, leg the leg's healing, healing the leg. leg. Mm -hmm. right? The cast is just allowing the leg to stay stable mm -hmm. so that the healing process can take place. And this is what meditation does. A lot of people put so much, particularly in the practice that I've been trained in, is that there's so much spiritual superiority on certain practices. Mm thinking they're there the best and this is the only way and this is the one and it's all about the practice, the practice, the practice. It's like, well, the practice is really just a device. It's like a cast that mm. is giving you the ability to experience you. It just stabilizes things. It stills things. It calms the mind so that you can experience what inherently is already there behind the noise of the mind. And whatever device you're using to get there, use it, you know. But the, here's the problem. If that cast stays on that leg, 
and we get so attached to it because, oh my God, the cast was like the best thing ever. It saved my leg. Like I'm not letting go of this cast. <laughs> Doctor says, no, we take the cast away. The job's done. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm leaving the cast <laughs> on. The cast saved my life leg. What a lifesaver. <laughs> yeah. What a lifesaver. And next thing, that cast can actually become the cause of gangrene. Mm. You can actually lose your leg. Yeah. Because of the cast. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that some practices are going to do that, but it's an extreme example. But what they can do is they can get in the way. Now, I say this with my students sometimes that are doing the mantra, doing the mantra, getting into mm. deeper states. I said, you know, let it go. You, you might already be there. And you're filling in the noise with the mantra. It's like maybe you don't need to repeat the mantra. And, and one of them said to me, oh, my goodness, like when you gave me the authority and the right to let go of the mantra just to be, that's when I really found it. It's like that's because you found what you already were. She didn't have all the noise of the mantras filling in the background. And so it's like the clouds just disappearing and then just blue sky, which was always behind the clouds. And now you can just be that. Mm. And so um, the device of whatever the technique to give you the ability to experience the silence of being is really what we're looking to, to do is to let go of whatever it is that we're using to get there. And once we're there, we can just be it. Mm. Yeah, I find, that, I find that really interesting. And also the part where everybody's cast is relative to them the one the tool that will support them yeah. is unique to each individual because i've definitely Absolutely. suffered from this in the past like i said like when you're a hammer everything looks like a nail running around broken toe going hey bro <laughs> like try meditating on it but yeah like that whole i think that's something that i've um i really respect for the way you articulate as well like you started the conversation there about like how everything is really subjective and i think what that really articulates is each individual's truth is is their own right yeah, I, I, for a long time I was really myopic and single-minded about the way to get there and mm. very attached to the particular style and the practice. And it was what I call spiritual narcissism, spiritual elitism, uh, su spiritual superiority, and um, that's just all ego anyway. Um, mm. Now I'm a lot more accepting about everyone's journey being relevant and true for them. Mm. And whichever path they're taking, whichever tool they're using, um, you know, yeah, do your research, find your way, um, knock on doors, test and trial. Um, and we're all doing it in just different ways. Mm. Yeah. And do you think we're inherently all kind of guided into a positive space or do you maybe not so much uh, like some of us can fall by the wayside? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, again... It's all the journey. It's just a matter how much resistance we have to it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about resistance and happiness. You know, like what's, what's going on there? Because I remember reading one of your things and it was uh, my resistance equates to my suffering. There's a beautiful quote. It's actually not mine. So I'll, it came from a, a teacher of mine and mm. um, he said, suffering is proportional to our resistance to change. And that's happiness, the one. Is pro <laughs> happiness is proportional to our ability to embrace change. Yeah. And it, it's every time. And change can only be one of two ways. It can be an external change or an internal change. So, mm. for instance, if, if you're struggling in a job and there's suffering there because you just literally you just can't stand that job, mm. you have one of two options. You change the job, mm -hmm. so that's external change. Just go and find another job. Mm. Um, if that's not a possibility at that particular point in time and you are constrained by the, uh, some certain circumstances that doesn't allow external change of that instance, um, then we have to change our inner world. So an example of that would be Ronnie, uh, a, character, a person in our film who had uh, a very challenging experience um, which won't give, won't give up too much away because if people haven't seen the film, it's a, it's a very powerful of course, um, experience reveal to experience. in the film. Yep. Yeah, but he, 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 he had a limiting uh, physiological thing that he couldn't overcome. It was just mm. a, it was a given. So he couldn't change the outer world. Mm. That was, would be the cause of someone suffering. So what he had the ability to do was change his relationship to that situation, mm. um, change the relationship to the circumstances and that's the variability that we have here mm, and the internal dialogue yeah yeah the internal dialogue and, and the perspective of that situation 
And yeah, I think that's, that's where we have the power is to look at the world and shift our mindset regarding the circumstances. And sometimes we can change the circumstances as well, which is amazing. And so my next question was going to be, how does meditation help with change based on what you just shared? But you've kind of already alluded to that. Um, And is it sort of that, like having that space of observation to at least then identify what is mine and what is the story? Is that? Uh, Definitely that. It gives us the ability to step back and start to observe. That's that Velcro I was talking about, that we've Mm. got the mind, which just is a deeply programmed and conditioned, um, habituated way of thinking. Uh, And it's in Sanskrit, it's called vasanas. So vasanas are tendencies of the mind, Mm -hmm. which is this pattern of neural pathways that just habituate. And then we have consciousness itself that can observe and reflect on the tendencies of the mind. And at that point, we have this now an ability as consciousness itself being able to watch the thinking process and start to reassess those patterns of thought and then maybe redirect them. And so meditation helps us to separate ourselves from the thinking process and be the watching process. And, you know, Descartes, the French philosopher, says, I think, therefore I am. So obviously not a meditator. He defined (laughs) himself through the thinking, but who who is that? Who's the thinker, you know? uh, Mm. You know, it's just a series of deeply conditioned thoughts mostly Mm. and very repetitive thoughts as well. Whereas the silence of observation or the watchfulness of awareness just can then watch the patterns of the mind and then redirect the mind to start thinking differently. Um, you know, people like um, who I'm a big fan of, Dr. Jonas Spencer, does a lot of work in this, yeah. which is re um, coding the mind mm. to start thinking differently. But it's very difficult to do that without meditation, I think. I don't think it's in, impossible, but I think it's a lot harder to do it without meditation. Mm. So, pardon me for asking all my deepest questions <laughs> in one. Yeah, I love it. That's great, man. Far so, away. <laughs> one of the so we're talking about meditation. We're also talking about tools. Like Dr. Joe Dispenza has some really cool tools and stuff as well as as um as does the the Stillness Project. So, in and around there, um, one of the things that I've recently come to terms with, and admittedly because of some of the life situations, I lost one of my mentors last year and she went early um, and realizing that, you know, death is definitely something that we don't have control over, Um, you know, and from there being in a really challenged place just as a young adolescent between the age of 25, 30, you know, you've got that ambition, you've got that essence, like that idea of control is quite a prevalent one. I'm going to set some goals. I'm going to hit some targets. I'm going to go get some shit done, right? Um, But from there, recently the conversation has really shifted for me internally. It's like, okay, can I learn to surrender and I can feel all my edges in and around the idea of surrender and I'm learning to walk into surrender. And the key thing being like the audacity that I actually think (laughs) I have an element of control over what's going on Mm -hmm. when so much has guided me to where I am. Even just the blessing of having this conversation with you is one of the key things, right? So everything is always kind of when we speak about consciousness, perhaps is like leading. It's got its own frequency and guiding its own way with its waves. So learning to embrace that and have that conversation more and more, there is this thing that is currently present for me, which is yes, surrender, but then at some point, I've taken some modicum of control over the start of my day to build a practice to then work and guide myself into being present and like priming myself. And this is probably a good way of putting it, priming myself to be a meditator that can then embrace the surrender. Um, I'm, they kind of feel it odd. Like it's kind of one of those conundrums you were talking to before as well. Is it a conundrum? Is there any insights you can like share with me in that space? I'm kind of, yeah, I think, Sure. There, there's um, intention, mm. which is um, I have an intention to make a film. I, I had an intention to make a film. I have an intention to write another book. I have an intention to you know host a retreat in Greece. I have an intention to do this. So these are bubbling up compulsions that manifest as an intention that you write down in a book or on your vision board, or whatever, and that becomes then your roadmap mm. for um the, the your next actions that you're going to express yourself and so just to be clear those intentions are not from up here those intentions are like and like they're generated from a deeper level of awareness yeah but they'll come through the mind so they definitely will come through as a thought so what happens generally is you know you and it won't always be something that comes through from 
the field, the field mm. of all possibilities. So when we go into meditation, we actually access a very dynamic space. It's generally not an empty cl- uh, space of nothingness. It's actually mm. for quite a lot of meditators, no doubt yourself as well, you get these impulses of intelligence and creativity mm-hmm. that come through the f- come through the, the portal of the mind and mm. manifest as a thought. So when we say manifest, it's like they, it creates a form, mm. which now is a thought. And then that thought um, then starts a series of events you might write it down on a piece of paper so now that thought's gone out of the from the field of all possibility mm. it's come through the mind manifest or created as a form which is a thought now that thought becomes even more of a form because you might write it down mm-hmm. um and then in the writing down you capture and harness it as a as a thought into more structure and then you go into the next series of events which would be actions to manifest it in even further Next yep. thing, you're holding a retreat in Greece or you've got a film that's up on stage or mm. uh, on a, in a cinema. And so that's a series of events that come through as these compulsions of expression or it might mm. be sometimes it might be just a, an innate desire from an ego level. It's hard to discriminate whether it's coming straight through field of infinite possibility as this pure divine expression and you being the conduit for it. Sometimes it might be your own personal desire. Mm. Um, right. And, you know, as, as long as there's still some of you here, which there is there's some of me here too, mm-hmm. we're going to have our desires coming through uh-huh. the portal of our mind and body as well. So there's right. this sort of emerging there. But then what we have to do is, and the thing, the difference between compulsions and intentions and desires is one tends to be motivated by some sense of lack and the need to have that desire fulfilled to mm. experience some level of elevation or fulfillment. Whereas mm-hmm. a compulsion is just like, you know what, if I feel this incredible compulsion, this intention to sort of manifest and express myself in this way, but if it happens and it doesn't happen, that's going to be interesting. I'm not really that fussed about it. Mm. Um, whereas the desire is like, you know, God, I really want that farm in Byron Bay. I hope I get that farm in Byron Bay. <laughs> and, you know, you want to manifest it, right? And I know that's a desire, right? So, yeah. And I'm cool with that. I can see that that's a desire. Mm. We are humans and we have this, uh, as Deepak calls it, an ongoing refinement of desires. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So, yeah, that's really poignant in terms of there is going to be that element of trying to control things, but it's like the flow also has its tendency with, with the surrender. Yeah, you just, get, you just get better and better at surrendering because you get more and more fulfilled innately through your own experience of being. Being itself mm. is fulfilled. So the more being we have and the less of the I, then the more stabilised in, in, in fulfilment that we experience, which means whether that happens or doesn't happen, I'm fulfilled anyway. So I feel kind of good about things no matter what. Mm. So, Tom, can I ask you, uh, what is next for you on the journey of like being like, I know there's that seeking, finding, sharing, and you're traveling all over the world sharing. You've just filmed an incredible video, which we, uh, movie, which we can't wait to sort of experience. Um, what is like, what is it continuously staying connected to oneself and seeing where the journey kind of goes? What is like, what inspires you and what's next? Yeah, we do have a roadmap and, um, you know, there's some big intentions, you know, the, the point of doing something like a film and a book that comes with it. There's an app we just launched a few days ago and there's a, a masterclass coming out in February, which is uh, how to overcome anxiety and depression naturally. Um, so these sort of four assets are all pulled together under the portal. Mm. Um, the importance of doing things like creating these, let's call them forms, is that they're kind of pointless unless people see them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so ne- then the next step after the creating of them is to get people aware of them. And that's uh, really, a, a, you know, it's like your podcast, you know, if no one listens to it, what's the point of it? So mm. you, you have an intention then to uh, enable as many people in the world as possible to see it. So that's a, a really engaged process. You've got to talk to distributors and publicists and, marketing teams and you know that's the the ground crazy podcasters <laughs> podcasters yeah <laughs> all of that you know so that's going to keep us fairly busy for a while mm. and you know getting in front of people and hopefully um inspiring conversation around the message that's in the film and the book about the fork in the road that we're at for humanity and and what that might look like if we take either of those two options at that fork in the road. And that's a really exciting and very important conversation that we need to have more of in the world today. Mm. And I'm really enjoying the conversation we've been having with our audiences in the Q&As after the screening of the film and on podcasts and stuff like that because it seems to me that there's an incredible openness Mm. to 
having these really deeper conversations that wasn't around seven years ago when we started this film. The film was just going to be about inspiring people to meditate. Mm. Now it's a lot more about what if we don't make these changes now? Yep. What, what is the price we will have to pay if we don't shift our state of mind? Because the, what, what inspires me most is that we can't go about creating change on the planet with a current state of consciousness or state of mind that we've had and have had for quite some time. Mm -hmm. We have to shift our state of minds. We have to shift our state of consciousness. Then we will start. So like it's happened for you, it's happening to me, it's happening to most of our students where that starts to inspire a shift in the way they do things, the way they think about the world, the way they relate to the planet, the way they relate to nature. And I think it's going to be very difficult to, as Einstein says, to solve the problems on the planet with the same state of mind that created those problems in the first place. Mm. Yeah, really... Yeah, it's 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 an interesting conversation to have as well in terms of what's what's coming next for our entire species based on yeah. like the you know because you can see how much thought has created like it's it's been such a blessing the fact that I can connect with you over the internet and you're you know a couple thousand miles away um, which is relatively close considering most of the other mm-hmm. podcast guests but that even that's a blessing in itself but like just the ability to connect someone made those headphones someone made these headphones mike i don't know what his name was i don't know what he looked like and yet you know the mind has given us all these incredible things but it is left unchecked it's the same thing as and that's like something that really dropped in really pointedly like left unchecked the mind can run so rampant and create such dis-ease internally and it seems like the collective mind left unchecked is also really good at just uh reflecting that same dis-ease at such a great but just on a grander level because it is it's a collective um yeah yeah, and it's how do we then have the dialogue in order to try and encourage everyone to then like build a relationship with mind that is healthy that can then potentially go on the journey of healing the collective mind and its wounds as well yeah, I feel that it's it's such a big ask and it's such a daunting proposition and I like to really simplify it and I try not to sort of make put it nebulous. Too much pressure on people having to make all the changes in the world. But one of, one of the simplest things I think we can do uh, is to start meditating regularly. Mm. And then if we start, you know, I, I, friends of mine are into plant-based medicine. Their, their perspective is if we just got everyone to do ayahuasca, then the world's going to be better. And that might be, I, it's not my path, but it doesn't mean it's not the right path for some people. Mm. And it might be another device to start meditation that helps us start to realize more of our essential nature, more of our integrated nature, more of our interconnectedness, not just with other humans, but with nature as well. So Life I find that a lot of, yeah, yeah I, I find a lot of those problems start to resolve themselves when we start meditating. Mm. And so for me, I don't want to go out and try and have all the answers to solving the world's problems. But if I just could inspire more people to meditate, then I think we'll probably start to find a lot of those problems will start resolving themselves collectively anyway. You and me both. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I just felt really I want to share with you is actually you know how we have this subjective reality which you're talking about in terms of life is I can choose to see it the way that I see it. I like talking to the conversation we're just having, I have found in the past that I can find myself quite demoralized thinking about the state of the world. And the thought, the thought form that I've chosen to adopt is that actually I'm the dead weight. Like looking back at my past and where I came from to, to mm-hmm. here, if I'm meditating, surely everybody else can do it, you know, and that inspires me to keep going. It's like, mate, if I'm here, I'm sure you can do it. This is how it's done. This is how it's done. Like, don't worry. It's not too hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. <laughs> Tom, I can't thank you enough for your time, your energy, your insights and your wisdom here today i really appreciate it and uh just before i leave for those that want to tune in and find out more about what's coming up uh, best way to connect with tom is uh they can go and find everything about the film and the book at enter the mm-hmm. and they can find everything about what i'm doing with retreats and coaching and things like that at tom cronin.com yep and uh, yeah, really accessible. The port. There's links to the portals from TomCronin.com as well if you want to check it out yeah. from there. So it's all it's all very well put together. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this film. And uh, yeah, just just really deep gratitude, and not just for this moment and the time and energy here today, but also all the bits and pieces that come along to inform the presence that you have here today. And wishing you all the best, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Yeah.
Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Love of the Inspired Evolution and sharing the Love of the Inspired Evolution. If you feel like this content may support, has supported you or may support anyone else that you know may resonate with the content of it, please share away and share the love around. Thank you guys so much. And to stay up to date on whatever's coming out with the Inspired Evolution, please subscribe. There's all these links in the bio for you to tune into the episodes and all these different platforms just so that message can get to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Stay inspired to evolve.